This is From Hero to Zero, a show about the misconception of the demise of the music industry. We talk to heroes to make sense of the alleged zero, the music business. Hey Dan, how are you hey, doing? I'm good, how are you doing? Very good, thank you very much. So Dan, you're the singer for the Canadian metal band Striker. Most probably many of our viewers don't really know about your band. Maybe you can give us a short introduction. Who are you, where are you from? Sure, uh, I'm Dan from the band Striker and uh, we're a Canadian metal band uh, that started in about 2007, 2008. And uh, we, I guess are sort of a mix between sort of new wave of British heavy metal sound and, and a little bit more of a modern twist to that, I guess. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much who we are. <laughs> Very good, in a nutshell, always good. So you started as a musician after the internet disrupted the whole music business. What is your perception of the business um, today as compared to before the internet came on? Well, I can say that I was p probably part of that disruption as a, as a kid when like Napster came out and stuff. Like, Everybody I knew was on that and downloading and stuff, so it was like we're sort of part of the problem. But uh, um, after a while getting into the music industry, we sort of learned that how big of an impact it was, what that downloading and stuff did. And uh, so I think th the biggest impact that we see from that is it's a lot easier to get exposure, but it's it's not as easy to sort of make money and, and do things like that. I think there used to be a lot more, like music's value kind of went down a little bit, like not in the sense of what people like as far as like music, like everybody, music's really important to everybody, most people, but um, I think like monetarily it's not as valuable as it used to be, so that affects bands in a pretty big way. Sure. Your fourth album, Stand in the Fire, came out this past uh, January, right? Uh, February. February, February sorry. February 5th. Okay. And uh, it is self-funded. Your fourth record is self-funded. Before yeah. that, you had records with, uh, with labels, um, played, toured, and so on. What was the reason to go um, self-funded, independent? Um, I think there's a lot of... Um, it's sort of, there's a lot of pros and cons to being on a label and also being independent and something we've sort of internally talked about for a long time and whether or not it makes sense to be with a label in this day and age. I think if you're a really popular artist, it can make a lot of sense to be on a label because there, there's just a reach that you can't do on your own. You almost need like a company doing everything for you. But for us, it's, we, our reach is a little narrower as being like a Canadian metal band, so uh, we sort of came to the point where we thought that we could probably just do it ourselves because we were, you know, having enough money coming in to sort of self-finance the band as a whole so we can kind of move on to the next step, which is to sort of fund our own albums and stuff like that. So. Uh, what do you have to do in addition to before you were self um, self released uh, well it's been a lot of work this time we we recorded everything ourselves and then sent it away to get mixed so that took a lot of time and a lot of like learning so to finally actually get the product finished um, it's amazing the amount of emails you have to send and stuff like that <laughs> it's so much work uh, and our guitar player Tim does a lot of that stuff and like he's just always always emailing and stuff and that's not something we had to do as much before it was like sort of behind the curtain and the label was doing it napalm records was doing a lot of that stuff for us so the the big difference is it's just a way there's a lot more workload to kind of get through so but if you enjoy it it's it's okay yeah. do you think having more work but then keeping basically all of uh, the money coming in is worth doing that much work? Yeah, we're, we're I, the album kind of just came out, so we're, we're waiting to see like what 
what that's going to be, right? Like we don't really know because we've never really done it. So we'll see. Like maybe next time we're back, you ask the same question, and I'll tell you whether it, it works or not. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um, and you didn't go through a crowdfunding platform to fund the new record, like uh, Pledge Music or Kickstarter. Uh, would that be something you would consider, or where do you see the, the pros and cons there? Um, that's something we talked about quite a bit. We weren't sure exactly what to do. Um, one of the main thing, one of the main reasons we didn't do it was because we had some money saved up from playing and, and doing stuff that uh, we were able to invest our in do the stuff ourselves, and then you don't have to wait for anything, you know, and, and you're not really relying because we're going to do the album no matter what. So we decided to do like a pre-order thing afterwards to uh, sort of raise money that way. And that was more towards helping us actually get the physical things printed and, and things like that, not so much the recording part of it. So, um, On the CD, there is a label, I forget, but there are foundations in Alberta that yeah. helped you. Is that correct? Yeah, we have some grant support and we've had some in the past as well. It's like uh, the Alberta Arts Foundation from where, where we're from and also Factor Music in Canada. They do, you have to apply and stuff and there's a lot of like hoops to jump through but um, uh, if you get approved they, they can give you funding and we were able to receive some funding for this album which was really sweet. So. It's super helpful because we're able to come do stuff like this, like come on tour. Exactly. And yeah. Which of course costs money. Yeah, it's a sinkhole for money most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> sure. You, you were mentioning reach, which maybe bigger acts can get through bigger companies. Um, however, I saw that you're quite active on social media. Um, can, how do you do that? Uh, do you have a strategy behind that? Uh, you also sponsor posts on Facebook I saw um, in order to have more reach again. Um, do you have a strategy there or do you just do it? <laughs> no, we don't have much of a strategy really. We just do it. Uh, like One of the things about Facebook which is kind of frustrating but it, it's also a little bit understandable is like in order to reach your fan base you have to pay and boost your, boost your posts and stuff like that so that people will actually see them or else they, it shows you statistics after you put a post up and it's like you reached like 1,000 of the 80,000 people who are following you on Facebook and it's like oh so if I have to pay like $80,000 to like reach 80,000 people it's like and that's not that's not what it is it's but, not that much right? yeah but still it's like it's um, I understand that that's their business model and because of Facebook the fans are there so it's easy to access them but um, so yeah we do that and then um, other stuff like Twitter. Twitter we're bad at. We're, we don't understand Twitter very well. So <laughs> we're bad at it. Yeah, we're okay. bad at it. <laughs> and then we have Instagram. Instagram's been a lot of fun. We've been sort of just more recently getting on that. Instagram. Yeah. Uh, what's your handle? Uh, Striker Metal. Striker Metal. Good. Yeah. We'll check it out. Yeah. Cool. And one more thing which you do is, uh, or you did, was before the actual um, launch of the new album uh, on February 5th, one week prior, you streamed the whole album online yeah um, some artists would claim that is uh, giving away or devaluating or devaluing your music again what's your take on that um, well I think it's sort of something that the uh, promotion guys we've been working with and uh, even like napalm records did the same kind of thing the, the album stream just gets people interested um, I think in the long run people are gonna listen to your album on whatever platform they're used to so it like for me I download a lot off iTunes um, like I like to buy music but I don't often buy CDs anymore because it's so easy to you get your phone and you just download the album and it's there and at least you paid for it I feel good about that because you do get some money from iTunes it's not like as much as you know getting the cash right in front of you but it's still something and then there's like stuff like Spotify and Apple music and stuff which I hadn't used up until like recently and uh, they are actually super awesome and easy to use and I, as soon as I started using it I was like oh no wonder people use this because it's just like you can listen to whatever you want although it's sometimes it can be difficult to figure out what you actually want to listen to. Sure. Yeah. Uh, would you say it helps also to discover new acts? Oh yeah 
I think so. Um, I haven't been like using it enough, probably, um, to know. I, like, I think there's like a whole world of like like Apple Music and and Spotify stuff that I just don't really understand like yet because I haven't used it that much. But um, uh, yeah, like things like even like YouTube and stuff. It's a super good way to find new bands and stuff with like recommended videos and stuff. I found so many bands. Usually like obscure bands though, it's like you watching like 80s metal videos and then you see like one with that's even weirder than the last <laughs> one and you go down that like YouTube hole and find something really strange, but yeah. Good to hear that I'm not the only one that has that experience. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Uh, one story which I was, which I found very interesting was, um, once you went to Europe with your demos to spread your music, is that a true story or do <laughs> yeah. you know about that story? Yeah, yeah. So in, uh, in 2008, in the summer of 2008, we went to uh, Europe just to see, or went here to Europe and um, just to go to festivals. So we went to the Bang Your Head Festival in Germany and Valken and sort of just traveled around seeing music festivals. And uh, we had brought, actually, a friend had brought this demo that we recorded beforehand, and like that was in like late 2007. And uh, we weren't actually, none of us brought a copy of it because we were like, whatever, we don't, we're not probably gonna keep going on this or whatever. <laughs> and uh, so he started showing people, like, didn't tell us or anything. We started showing people, and then, and then like a couple labels, like, emailed us, like, smaller metal labels, saying, hey, you guys, like, we heard your demo at this festival. Are you guys wanting to do an album or like whatever? And so, and then we were like, oh, I guess we should actually do this. And then that's kind of how we got. Because back then we were just kind of doing it for fun, and then we never really thought like, hey, we could actually like be serious about it. Like, so, so he brought a CD, is that correct? Or no, he had like this MP3 player that he like made everyone listen to, and he had his <laughs> headphones. He'd be like, you gotta listen to this, and then people were like, okay. And that worked, obviously. Yeah, it's funny how that happened but yeah exactly well Dan it was very very nice meeting you and yeah. talking with you thank you so much and all the best for the future and next time you come back you'll tell us about uh, how the record tell you, we'll have proceeded sacks of money with us <laughs> <laughs> that sounds good <laughs> thanks all the best thanks yeah. man